Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guest is Daniel Suarez. He's a best-selling author of sci-fi and techno thrillers. I've actually been a fan of Daniel's for a long time, all the way back to his first novel, Damon, and its follow-up, freedom.tm. I'm not going to say much about them, but they are really good. So if you like this show a bit, you want to start early in Daniel's collected work, start with those two. They're really, really good. More recently, I read his two sci-fi novels, Delta V and Critical Mass, about an imagined early period of space exploration. Welcome, Daniel. Oh, thanks for having me, Jim. Yeah, really looking forward to this. You know, as uh, regular listeners know, I don't do a lot of fiction. I've had on Corey Doctorow, David Brin, Gary Benger, well, it's one or two others, I don't even remember, all science fiction writers, even though, frankly, I read more literary fiction than science fiction. And in, but in each of those cases, we covered, while we covered the plot loosely, enough for people to know what's going on, we dug more deeply into the ideas and it was based on the ideas on why I you know, asked them to be on the show. And the same is, same is here. Daniel's two books are great sci-fi adventure thrillers, but I was particularly taken by the detail and plausibility of his imagined world and the tech that supports it. So why don't we start there? Why did you decide that 2032 and the an early imagined start to human space exploration was such a good idea for two novels. And how did you do the research? Yeah, okay. It was quite a journey. I'd say probably eight or nine years from the beginning of thinking that I wanted to do this story. And this story is is originally envisioned as a trilogy. So I'd say I'm two thirds of the way through that trilogy at this point. And what interested me was the idea And I'd always been interested in sci-fi from a young age, uh, reading even High Frontier, Gerard K. O'Neill's nonfiction book, Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos, all of that stuff really fired my imagination, read dozens and dozens of hard sci-fi books, Ringworld, all all of that stuff, Asimov. And those visions for the future fascinated me. And then we all experienced what happened after the space shuttle, this sort of fallow period where we thought, at least I, I did and many others, thought that we were going, that space was going to be big at that time. And then we sort of crashed down to Earth, both figuratively and, and in reality, in 40% of the space shuttles. And I started comparing that to the sci-fi that we see on a routine basis, these visions of the future four or 500 years where we have a fully established celestial civilization. And I started thinking, how do we actually make that happen? I mean, really, from where we're standing here in the present, how do we go step by step by step to make that happen? How do we cross that chasm? How do we bridge that chasm between our reality and that more expansive future, that more possible future? And no hand-waving. And so I set about doing the research to see what that would take. I didn't bring a lot of preconceptions to that. I didn't know whether that would take the form of Mars colonization or what have you. And fortunately because I'd written a number of books that scientists and engineers and, and entrepreneurs and others really enjoyed, I, that gave me access to some really interesting people, both in NASA, government, Silicon Valley, many places. And so I was able to ask some of these folks their opinions on the subject and start to canvassing and gathering what would be the most possible, most likely route to start to go step by step to that future. And that's really how I came upon the, the, the general arc of the narrative for the Delta V trilogy. That's great. The other thing that you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on this too is clearly the path that you envisioned. And Delta V was published, what, 2019? So it was probably written in 2017. April 2019, yeah. Yeah, so it was probably written 2017, 2018. Yep. You envisioned a world where private space was the main driver. Yes, Yeah. And part of that has to do, again, with risk-taking. 
during the research, I talked to a number of people in NASA, and you can see that in, in my previous books as well. And I have a, a, a pretty good feel for NASA culture. There's a lot of people who have great ideas in NASA, but of course, it is a bureaucracy. And the way it's funded makes it very difficult to take a lot of risks because, of course, the funding mechanism is such that if you're going to do a multi-year project and every year NASA's budget gets reviewed with possible cuts in mind, any project has to be distributed across many different congressional districts. It's sort of a pork barrel spending thing. And the scientists don't really have any control over that. And so if you want to take these focused and considered risks uh, right now, the entrepreneurial private space, that's really the way to push things forward quickly. And of course, we see that manifesting now. In some ways, I think it's the beginning of a renaissance of private space. Yeah, it turned out you were right, right? You know, the uh, the vision you had back when you were putting this together, uh, I think at least so far has turned out to be right. I mean, how quickly private space has come on, this, despite the fact yeah, that- Yeah, and I think this is just the beginning. I think we really are at the beginning of a very interesting period. I mean, I guess you can just go take a look at the webcam that's focused on Boca Chica to see something that's bigger than a Saturn V just sitting there. And that's just one small corner of what's going on with private space exploration right now. Yeah, and you you draw some fairly vivid characters, at least a couple of which I could have, I could say, all right, this looks like a, a Elon Musk character, and this one looks like a Jeff Bezos character. But they, you know, again, you you I have you, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you you tarted them up pretty good. But then you also added some other characters. We'll we'll call them a composite. Yeah, right? yeah and, and yeah. you're right. I do add my own uh, billionaire character, Nathan Joyce, who is uh, again. I'd say a miss, the missing link in, in, what, uh, in what we'd see here is a, a character you and I have previously discussed history in the age of exploration a little bit and talk about the colorful characters that populated that whole milieu. Normal personalities do not open frontiers. They're typically big personalities, people who, with all their flaws, take bold visions and go forward. And that's sort of what we need right now. Yeah, that you know that was a very interesting stake in the ground because Nathan Joyce, in some sense, the the dark star that organizes this whole constellation, you know, this black hole. Yeah, he's the billionaire in my novel because you got to have a billionaire, right? Yeah, yeah, and and yet, you know, by objective measure, he's a pretty despicable guy. You know, he lies, cheats, steals, seems to be a sociopath, and yet. <laughs> And yet, right? Talk about the kind of the wrestling match you made with yourself on how despicable he could be and still be the driving force of the story. Well, this this went into a bit since I've read widely in history. Uh, again, going back to historical figures and the people who do open up frontiers. Frontiers are wild and woolly places. It's um, it's where people have to really force issues and have a bold vision and accept. A, let's call it an elevated level of risk. And that elevated r- level of risk in, in many cases involves putting people in danger. And it's whether those people are fully informed or not is the question. And I would argue for the people involved in, in Delta V and critical mass, they are fully informed. Are laws broken? Yes. And then that brings up the question, which I also explore in the books, of what is the reach of laws? For example, the Outer Space Treaty and, and the Moon Treaty and the Artemis Accords, all of these, you know, there's a big discussion of, of law in space. And of course, in reality, it's a theoretical. So in other words, what is to stop or prevent? How do you enforce laws? I wanted to unpack all of those assumptions because, of course, you know, I also brought authoritarian systems into those books. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting that yeah, buccaneer sort like Joyce allowed you to probe on the edges, right? And beyond the edges, which is- And uh, I didn't which- want to shrink away from that discussion. I think it, it recently in particular, sci-fi has been reluctant to, let's say, give up markets like China. It's like, I wanted to really unpack that. Again, I have nothing against Chinese culture or the people. Authoritarian governments, I have a problem with. Yeah. And you did not pull. You did not pull any punches there. I do I not. Say. No, and and I wouldn't do that for for our system or theirs. I really wanted to examine the future, because of course, whatever value system we bring into space, and of course, this is an accelerating push to space. It in, involves many countries of the world and many private companies. Whatever value system we bring there is going to create an inertia that will redound to affect thousands of generations to follow. 
So I really wanted us to have a, a conscious discussion of that. I wanted to have characters addressing what are we doing up here? What legal system are we building? What framework? What economy? What technological standards? All of that. Yeah, that's a. Uh- you know, again, these kinds of choices, choice making at the beginning is always interested me. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in my outline and talk about the kinds of people that Joyce and his operation chose to recruit to the first mission, the first big mission, which we'll talk about where it goes later. So let's not, we won't quite give that away yet. Right. But you obviously gave some really careful thought to the ensemble of people that were chosen. I absolutely did. Yeah, give us give us you know your your process and what conclusions you came to. Sure. Some of my ad- advice on this later in the manuscript came from Jim Logan, who used to be a, a flight surgeon for the space shuttle, uh, the NASA space shuttle program, and he dealt with teams of people, and I was very interested in his advice on that. But the key for me was the people who do these types of things, um, explorers. I think the the gene is the DDR7 gene. It's called the wanderlust gene. This gene is prevalent on, upon pe- uh, among people who enjoy novel experiences, which is a sort of polite way of saying they're a little crazy. These are the types of people you see base jumping off of cliffs and and climbing mountains and diving deep into caves, doing incredibly risky things when they do not need to. And one of the one of the postulates I had in this story and, and I, I have in real life is that we have always had explorers amongst among us. And in and throughout our history, we have always had a frontier, some area beyond the map that these people could go and they could push out that frontier. And that would redound to the benefit of all of humanity, ultimately. And then in recent years, we have fully explored most of the earth, yet yeah, not the oceans, But the areas upon which we can live, we have largely explored and mapped, even the seabed. And so these people, they spend a lot of time doing things like risking their lives and filming it and perhaps putting it on Instagram, but they keep doing these things, climbing mountains, racing cars and whatnot. And I think that there is an evolved purpose for these people. And that's what I had my Nathan Joyce character, through the advice of his psychologists and others, realize was that they wanted to find people who were going to risk their lives anyway, who thrived in in unsettled, very dangerous environments, who in many ways had difficulty fitting in a normal everyday life. And that's really the cast of characters that I've built here who crew the Constantine, which is the asteroid mining vessel in the first book, Delta V. These are not the best and the brightest in the sense that they went to all the Ivy League schools and excelled in all the standard establishment ways. They are very unusual people, that they are deep sea divers. They are geological petroleum engineers who do deep sea exploration, things like that, mountain climbers, uh, base jumpers. Yeah, it was quite quite amazing bunch. Now, it kind of reminds me of the early days of NASA where they you know, heavily overselected on test pilots. Test pilots. Uh, and I've been, you know, I have been lucky enough to actually know three test pilots of the, of the greatest generation variety. That's a breed apart right there. Man, those are some people, you know. You know, I, I, I'm a bit of a risk taker, but man, talk about <laughs> these guys. And the thing I find so amazing about the test pilot personality is they are, or at least the ones that I know, because they survived, right? Yes. Is that they yeah, that's are right. that's why you totally know them. wild people, yet totally competent and calculating at the same time. Well, there was a there was a great. I think it was Bill Stone. He's a, a cave explorer, cave diver. He was one of the models for uh, some of the cave divers in, my, in this in the book Delta V. One of the things that he said uh, through a, a friend of mine who who uh, dove with him and, and caved with him was that it really isn't about a an adrenaline thrill. It's it's almost a Zen state to get into. Go to the edge where one wrong move can kill you, but you're in control. You are competent. You are mastering the variables. And if you are panicked, then something has gone terribly wrong. And yet they're in a very dangerous environment, but they're keeping themselves safe through careful application of experience. And I think that's really the the key thing. As I say about flying, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, there's one story that I – research for this project was always – wonderful. I mean, it was thrilling. I eventually had to make myself stop. And of course, now that I'm researching the third book, it's great fun again. 
But one of the stories from Neil Armstrong, which really struck me, and you probably know this one as well, is when he was flying, I guess it was called the Flying Bedstead, this simulator for the lunar lander that simulated one-sixth gravity. And again, it's a very clever application of engineering by the engineers at the time. But here's a guy who gets on board this thing, and it is, it is loaded with incredibly flammable explosive fuel. And he crashes the thing, and I think he, he jettisons at just the right time, and then he goes right back to flying another copy of it, like as if it, it didn't happen. Like he almost died, and that's, he made notes about that. And then he goes right back to it. And that's a very different type of person, a person who just digs in and does the work necessary. Yeah, I'm assuming, I haven't really tracked it, that the current crop of NASA astronauts no longer fit that profile. Well, I think that's a common thing that I read about, and that is that the perception of acceptable risk has really shifted far, far, far into the safety margin. Now, still, it's, it's much more dangerous than average people would entertain. But again, if we're talking about a, a real frontier and opening it up, and, and this is where I guess the point I bring up climate change, if you take the fuse of climate change burning, and if we feel that it is also urgent that we provide economic opportunity for billions of people in a world that it insists on developing, let's say in the developing world, we really have got to move things more quickly. We have got to start building an off-world economy that that originates new resources and energy without further despoiling the earth. And I think that's a time fuse that that is is burning quite fast. Uh, I'll add into that the risks of the Kessler syndrome, that is these large constellations of satellites that are being lofted, not just by Elon, but I know that Jeff Bezos wants to uh, put up thousands, as do other countries, OneWeb and others. And then there's governments that want to put up more and more of these satellites in low earth orbit. And in the event of a conflict, one of the first things that will happen is rival nations will attack each other's satellites, and anti-satellite weapons are proliferating quite quickly. And if that happens and you have a cascade of debris in orbit, that could prevent us from gaining access, safe access to orbit for a generation or more. So again, we have these urgent sort of timelines that I think we really should move quickly to try to avail ourselves of space and build out that off-world economy before circumstances on Earth make it difficult or impossible. Very good. Now, one of the plot devices early in Delta V is you introduced an economist, Sinkar Koropati, I think it was. Right, right? Dr. Doom. (laughs) Yeah, Dr. Doom. And, you know, he educates us and Joyce a bit about monetary theory and how money really works. Rational reserve banking in particular. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, he does a brilliant job of it. And as I was mentioning in our pregame, it's an area that I study and listeners of the show know that I have strong opinions about this. And he does a a much better job than usual in fiction of accurately describing our monetary system. However, I had one. <laughs> but again, you know that's the th- that's the advantage of being a novelist, not a politician. Right. You, know, right. you are allowed one assumption, right? And and this was that Koropati basically just poo poos and waves away the possibility of replacing our debt based monetary system with a non debt based monetary system, and and that essentially is you know kind of the core motivation for Joyce to uh, do all these crazy things to you know build a a frontier economy again to save fractional reserve based monetary systems when the other alternative is to get rid of them and replace them. In fact, as all my listeners know, I've designed such a system. I did did so before. Bitcoin, and I would say my system is better. And those who want to check it out, check it out by searching on YouTube for Jim Rutt dividend money. And <laughs> I just wanted to point out that that was that was one that, while brilliant in the exposition, was a casual wave of the hand saying, "Ah, oh, nothing we can do about it. We're kind of stuck with our fucked up fractional reserve system." <laughs> well, I will say this: that that character was brought in in particular by the Eric Lazowski character. I, I like to think of Koropati as a sort of a, a high priest brought in to give absolution to a billionaire like Nathan Joyce, who had built an empire that was a, a, a mountain of debt, a very tremulous mountain of debt that was teetering on the edge of collapse and sort of encouraging him to understand it's not your fault. It's the system. And you, by really 
going for the, the, the bleachers, really trying to try to hit a home run, that's the only way to save it. And that was in an effort to urge him to push it to the limit. Yeah, and I, and I saw that. Yeah, you know, that was the you know, that was the ethical motivation. Not only save yourself, but save the world. That's right, right. and that's why it's called the billionaire whisperer. That that particular chapter. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. yeah, and and by the way, the idea that we could replace our existing system, certainly we could. I always look back though at how people actually behave in the real world, <laughs> which can be very frustrating at times. You know, we have replaced our monetary system multiple times in history, so it is yeah. possible. Well, yeah, I always point back to people like in the 1800s, the fractional reserve banking system. There were so many different banks and currencies in the early days of the United States. It's amazing. A lot of people forget that. Yeah, the free banking period where yeah. any bank could issue its own money. That's right. And that's before you, you had gold standard, then you had the Granger movement, and we actually had all these – these economic movements in, in sort of proto-economic systems. So it was very much designed, right? It, 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 it's not just a, a fact. People actually built it. They, they yeah, argued yeah. and debated over it and built it. And then it, it became the established system and, and accumulated all of its deficits and other problems. Yeah, in fact, uh, if people want to learn more about this, Milton Friedman wrote a brilliant book called The Monetary History of the United States from 1863 to Present. I think it ends in the 1980s, maybe, or 70s. But he goes through that whole middle period of free banking, greenbacks, silver, gold, and then, of course, the, the two big ones, the Federal Reserve in 1913 and Bretton Woods in the aftermath of World War II. And, Doesn't it seem uh, a bit familiar in the sense that we do see a lot of these uh, uh, experiments with money, digital money. Otherwise, you know, you've got central bank coins, all of this other stuff. And it seems like we're starting to go through this period again where people are experimenting. I, I guess I would describe it, and it has been described by others, as a triple entry ledger. This idea instead of a double entry ledger, you have that transparency of the blockchain to try to as, as a new innovation. I do think it's it's intriguing. Yeah, very, very much so. Now, Another thing, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you basically have a bunch of these asshole billionaires and their, uh, and their, and their ass kissers strutting around. And, you know, I got to say, when I see those things, I say, you know, we really ought to get the guillotine out and just lop these fuckers' heads off. These people really are nasty, bad people. You know, you know was, that, was that your intent or, or, or what? Wow. Uh I would say, hang on, let me, let me turn the volume down on that a little, just in the sense that I, I guess what happens is when you get billions and billions of dollars, what that does is it amplifies your personality. And, and to borrow a line from, I think it's Richard Pryor, it's like, if you're an asshole, <laughs> that's just going to amplify it. Uh, and then, of course, there's all the people who may not say no to you because you present a huge opportunity to them. We do have a lot of gigantic personalities striding the landscape right now for good or ill. And yet, it's interesting. I like to think that the balance between them, that is, uh, let's say, government and these, these uh, you know, multi-billionaire entrepreneurs trying to you know, break new, new barriers, break into new frontiers, some of them doing very foolish or short-sighted things. And sometimes the same person doing some good things and then some foolish things. It's been my experience as I've had a, an opportunity to meet a great number of these, these billionaires. I, I tend to think of them, I guess I'll give you a good example. I was at an event and, and I, since it was a private event, I won't say which, which billionaire it was, but I spent a couple of hours walking with this billionaire who was a fan of my books at a closed event. And at the end of that, I was exhausted by the sheer number of people who approached the billionaire with ideas for, for companies and for patents, and it just did not stop. And this was a closed event. And I remember thinking that it must be very difficult to try to, to just keep uh, you know, your mind focused on one thing when you have people coming at you from every single direction. So I, I factor that into it. Yes, there are some outlandish people inflicting their egos upon all of us. Uh, it's my hope that, you know, again, the opportunities in space are so manifest that I think that that's a great place for them to spend their time because, you know, the idea of, of a billionaire redesigning our social systems here on Earth without much input, that is especially frightening. 
Yeah, I will. I will agree. You know, as as in some ways repulsive as they are, the dick waving contests about who's got the biggest rocket at least is probably beneficial for humanity as opposed to other things they could be doing. At least in the short term, and you know, of course, I would I would quibble with a lot of the idea of of let's say using a a massive starship to do point to point travel on Earth. It's just a ludicrous idea to me. You'd blow every single window out of every downtown. Not to mention the upper atmosphere and you know all the the carbon you'd be putting into that. However, having a very useful large heavy lift rocket, super useful. And and again, the government is subsidizing a lot of this. I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate that when it comes to SpaceX or others. A lot of these companies are being funded by the largesse of, of the government, whether they want to face that or not. So it's not quite picking winners and losers. It's it's like the government is trying to foster innovation in this area, and we'll see where it goes. And I think ultimately, people, that is governments, will have some say in it. And I think that is also important because we do not want to have an off-world economy that is entirely ruled by one person or two people. We do want to have some input. Yep. Yep. Let's go back here to the characters, the, 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 you know, the, the, core, the core focus team. Sure. James Ty. Uh, how the hell that was spelled? It didn't it was pronounced Ty, but it was spelled what T I E G A. Yeah, Welsh name. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, he's sort of the main character, but the rest of them are kind of interesting too. As, as we said earlier, extreme activity people. A fair number of them were also people on the outs with their families. Was that yes. by design? It was very much by design. And it and it's partly these are people who are misfits or outcasts or adrift, who are not readily understood by the people in their lives. And, you know, in talking to a lot of extreme cavers and others, now, many of them are fully functional, but a lot of them are difficult to understand by people in their lives. And and whether that's, and this is my own personal belief, I, I think it's that a lot of these people do things that are so exceedingly dangerous that it's it's anguish inducing for the people in their lives. And, and then, of course, I've met people who have spent many years caving and other expeditions and weren't present for key aspects of their family and, and grew apart. So I wanted to show these characters as prime candidates for an expedition where they would be asked to go away for four years. And, and in this case, the case in Delta V, because the, the period for this asteroid, Ryugu, to come around again is about four years on average. And so they had to go away for this trip for four years. And you didn't want somebody who was so heavily rooted into the social life here on Earth that they would be greatly missed. Because, of course, this is an unsanctioned asteroid mining mission in Delta V. It is not popularized. It's not celebrated. It's illegal. And it's being done without permission, uh, completely illegal. And that's the thing, though. So many people perish climbing Mount Everest, falling off cliffs, doing free solos, in diving accidents. And the thinking that that's fine, we don't bat an eye at that. But the idea of eight people going and doing a dangerous, very, very dangerous space mission and possibly altering the entire trajectory of civilization for the better, that actually, you know, if these people were going to go off and risk their lives doing windsuit jumping anyway, and they want to do this, why should we stop them? And it, it was an interesting question for me. And honestly, I haven't received a lot of pushback about that. Yeah, I thought that, you know, again, look at the historical equivalents back in the age of exploration. Yes. You know, Magellan's voyage took three years, right? Yeah. Around the world. And I, I was mentioning in the pregame, I did find the name of the book. I recently read a very interesting book called Conquerors, How Portugal Forged the First Global Empire. And yeah. if if you if you took one of those annual ships from Portugal to India, it was a minimum two year commitment. A year, you know, you, you go. could go, go one year and then the next year you could come back. That was the earliest, but most people end up staying. Now, they were the spaceships of their day, and they were at the very edge of the technology, and that's what pushed the technology forward too. And again, there are some amazing rascals in that book, right? Absolutely. Even make Nathan Joyce look like a choir boy, right? Well, I, you know, also let's wonder, I think it's about 1600. 1500. In the age of exploration. Well, I'm, I'm thinking when the corporation first rears its head ah, is yeah, around yeah. that period. This is the first time in history when private mercantile individuals had to raise sufficient capital to build fleets of these ships. Prior to that point, if you weren't doing long sailing, you know, that would be a much smaller and, and more logistically 
simple exercise. But if you're going to go all the way around Africa and all the way to the Spice Islands on the far side of the, the world, you're going to need to marshal some capital. And so creating a new economic form in terms of the corporation, the East India Corporation, the Dutch East India Corporation, things like that, starting to rival the power of monarchs and then eventually exceed it. Because I think at one point, the East India Corporation had a larger fleet than, than the government they were part of. Yep. And of course, some very interesting financial innovations like insurance, whereas, you know, insurance was pushed way ahead with yep. maritime insurance. You know, that was some of the cutting edge finance of its day. So this is what I was trying to do here with this book is I really wanted to roll all of that together, the economics, the geopolitics, the astropolitics, the chemistry, the on and on, the technology. All right. Yeah. Let's actually go on to that, uh, into some of that. But before we do, one of the great set pieces in Delta V is the confrontation at a conference of some sort <laughs> of, uh, of the boy billionaires. And I, I thought one of the most interesting and probably controversial components was the argument about asteroids versus Mars. Why don't you tell us that story? Yeah. Okay. So this is a chapter called the the potlatch or potlatch, and it it dramatizes a debate between the reigning billionaires in private space development. So one can imagine all of the billionaires you think of when you think of space getting onto a stage and debating their various approaches in a very bare knuckle sort of debate, a very honest debate, which was encouraged by the Erica Lazowski character, I'd say even spurred on, and also spurred on by my fictional Nathan Joyce billionaire, who's sort of a, oh, I don't know, a, a, a spoiler trying to get this to occur. And the key thing I was trying to get out there was a lot of times I'll run into solutions of what we should do in space, for example, Mars colonization, really pushing for that as if it's a absolute proximate priority, that we make that the number one thing we should be doing. And in all the research I did for these books, I've really come to the definite opinion that that is not the very next thing. That should not be the important thing we're doing next. That doing a flags and footprint mission to Mars, we have much, much more urgent priorities in near space, cislunar space, which is to say the, the neighborhood around the Earth and the moon, the Earth-Moon system going about 60,000 kilometers beyond the moon to L2. You know, it's very important that we start to build an off-world economy and industrial infrastructure there as opposed to investing, let's say, half a trillion dollars in 10 years of our times to go to Mars, to send six people there. And that's really what that chapter is exploring. And I wanted to have an honest discussion of the drawbacks of Mars colonization. And this actually came out of Again, I was having a, a discussion with a billionaire who will remain uh, nameless, but this was a real life billionaire. And the discussion I was having with him, he had read Damon early on. He was a fan of it. So he welcomed me to come and talk if I ever had questions. And I had some questions about space. He asked what my book was about. And I told him it was going to be about asteroid mining. And he took exception to that, thought it was a stupid idea. And we started to have a discussion about why I thought it wasn't a stupid idea and the lack of a gravity well, for example, all of the arguments that were in the potlatch chapter. And we really started to have quite a vigorous debate. And some of the employees in the area kind of, you know, poked their head up above their chemicals, like who came here to argue? And it really wasn't meant to be an argument. But after I left that place, we left on, on amicable terms, just fine. I started thinking that that conversation that I had just had, that debate, really needed to happen publicly, that not just between myself and him, but between the billionaires and their different ideas about what the priorities are for humanity in space, what we're doing there, when we should do it, what technologies, all of that should be pulled out into the light and talked about, not just in a fawning way by, let's say, one media outlet or another that's trying to maintain access, but really a bare knuckle discussion of it. And that was the purpose of that chapter. I wanted readers to come away with a real honest assessment of what the opportunities and the risks are. And that's why I, I gave a fair assessment of the pro-Mars crowd versus others. In other words, I used the real arguments they used. I wasn't trying to create a straw man. I was trying to really explore this terrain so that people come away with a good idea. Yeah, and you did a great job because I went and did a little bit of research and everything you said in there is real. 
Well, a lot of that with the perchlorates on Mars came from Pete Warden. And uh, again, Pete Warden used to be head of NASA Ames. And I remember I was sitting in a, again, this is another event, and some some presenter got up, a scientist, and started talking about Mars colonization. And, and afterwards, Pete, really, he took exception to it because he said that, you know, the perchlorates on the surface of Mars would preclude that type of thing. And he just, you know, said it's just so seldom discussed. And I began to ask him more and more questions about that. And of course, that's just one element of of what's concerning. Okay. Another very interesting examination is the contrasting theories of robots versus humans on the early missions. Yeah, this is the other thing that I I think a lot of depictions of space, they, they show people out in spacesuits doing all these things, cavorting around the surface of the moon and Mars. And again, when we really dig into the radiation environment, both galactic cosmic rays and solar radiation, micrometeors, it is a very, 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 very dangerous environment uh, for human beings, for, for creatures with DNA and cellular activity. You know, these particles coming in at relativistic speeds can really tear through your DNA pretty well. And so the idea of using telepresence, that is virtual reality, computers, or I should say robots, just like an Atlas one, for example, the Boston Dynamics one that we see doing backflips. You take a robot like that and you put it on the lunar surface with a really good volumetric light VR headset and a low millisecond lag, and you can start to get some real work done on an ongoing basis, not just eight exhausting hours in a pressurized suit. Where just just closing your hand in those gloves is exhausting. I mean, you know, if you read the accounts or if you speak to astronauts who've done EVAs, it is an exhausting and dangerous thing. The other thing I wanted to dig into was the fact that with our existing spacesuits, people do need to pre-breathe for two hours before they go out. I think that is not fully appreciated when people watch sci-fi. They think people just throw a helmet on and they duck out if there's an emergency. It's much more involved. And if we can have really capable uh, teleoperation humanoid robots on the surface, we could get a hell of a lot more done. Yeah. And, and yet on the other side, you make the point in the story that as the time lags get larger, it you know may not actually be practical to have robots be the ones who can solve the problems in real time way out at the cutting edge. Well, that's the old all or nothing thing. I think it's lock long is the phrase that NASA uses, loss of crew, loss of mission. If you are sending out a mission, let's say a remote probe, and anything unexpected goes wrong, anything, it's typically a full loss of the mission. Now, sometimes NASA can save it by using fail safes or getting very creative. But if you have a robotic unit that the environment doesn't meet what was expected or something unexpected happens, that entire thing could be a loss. And the great thing about humans is we can adapt, we can iterate. And I think that was one of the key things I was trying to get across, is that in this asteroid mining, the reason they bring people is not so that they go out there with a pick and shovel and start picking away at the asteroid. That's not the, that's not the goal. Mining is very different in a near zero or microgravity environment. But so that they're there to fix things when the unanticipated occurs. And of course, you, you recall from reading Delta V, a great many unexpected things occur because people are present on site. They can innovate. They can improvise and make it move forward. And I feel that I succeeded in that when a a robotics expert contacted me to say, you know, that is a really great thing. If we were able to do that, we could advance things so much more quickly. If we had a person within, let's say, the region, because of course, In the book, they're not out there right next to the robot. They are within a cocooned area, shielded from radiation, remotely controlling the robots. And on rare uh, rare occasions, they have to go out and fix it. To and I'm not sure you you might want to bleep this out, but I believe the expression from the book was, you know, please go out there and unfuck that equipment. And that's that's essentially what they do. Oh, as as all our listeners know, fuck is one of my favorite words. So we will definitely not be bleeping that out. The uh, of course the other thing that you make a you know considerable a good and very interesting distinction is the the speed of light lags, right? Yes. And it's uh, also a big deal in you know the second book, Critical Mass, where you know you can do certain kinds of things via remote access from Earth to the Moon, but that's a three seconds round trip, plus or minus, right? Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Yeah, if you're if you're trying to re- control a robot that's digging around on the surface of the moon from Earth, that's that's problematic. But if you have 
you know, less than a second lag because you're you're up in orbit, you're in lunar orbit. You know, you if you have sufficient mass shielding you, you can through teleoperation have a very realistic real time uh, experience with especially a, a high quality VR headset. You could do a lot of work on the moon and then you could switch. You could sort of do a hot seat rotation like you're done with your shift and somebody else gets into that seat and continues whereas if you're doing an EVA limitations on air, limitations on radiation exposure, and so on, exhaustion, that kicks in. Yeah, I, I like that you basically define this sweet spot between humans and robots, right? So it's, as you say, it's not all or nothing. That's right. We work doing together. Human, doing humans in spacesuits, doing all the work, not so practical or too dangerous. That's right. Trying to do it from Earth, uh, yeah, it's feet of light, kid. You know, that's the law, boys. You can't violate that one. And I tried to bring the commercial incentive in it because, again, if you have some companies that are willing to send people and those people want to go and they want to have that experience, take that risk perhaps get a share in the enterprise, they can advance much more quickly than those people who are more timid about it. And then that creates that space race, sure. But any frontier is going to be like that. And I really wanted to explore both, again, all of the real opportunities and the real risks so that people could explore that, the readers could really see what is at stake. And it has been gratifying to get the emails back from people saying, I had no idea that it could, you know, that all of this technology existed and had been researched in the 60s and 70s, and this goes into critical mass a bit through mass drivers and solar power satellites, and also that these, some of these are being prototyped now and are real. These are real technologies. Yeah, I didn't find anything in the book that was, you know, complete magic, right? Some of them were a little ahead. We'll we'll get into some more of these. Now, let's go into this next thing. And I will say, man, you have corrupted my brain uh, (laughs) uh, in that when I, once I finish reading Delta V, Whenever I read anything about space, the first thing I'm, I'm saying is, what's the delta V between A and B, right? Oh, that's great. I, is my it, work is done. That's wonderful. Is that bullshit or not, right? Like I, looked, I try to do a rough back of the envelope calculation, and I go, you wait, but that ain't going to fucking work. Or hmm, That's pretty clever. Could you explain? And, and for the listeners, the issue here is, again, it, for profit and loss, if you are doing commercial space, delta V has to do with acceleration or deceleration, basically shifting your, your rate of movement, and that requires propellant, and that requires mass, and that brings in the rocket equation. So essentially, the lower the delta V for something, the more cost-effective it is, and that helps to determine. So if you were to take a look at a, a C chart from that age of exploration you and I were talking about, one might look at the trade winds and, and avoid the doldrums, whereas in cislunar space, you would be looking at the delta V between various points in orbit. Yeah, and we have a pretty sophisticated listenership here. Think of it like a scientific American level listenership. So is it fair to describe Delta V as something like the amount of fuel per unit of mass it takes to move something from A to B in a unit of time? I would say that is a close description of it, except I I would say it goes back to the amount of propellants you need to to cause or the expenditure of energy you need to slow down or speed up to achieve a certain trajectory that results in you arriving at the right location at the right time. So it's a calculation. An operative de- definition of delta V would be a change in velocity, like a measure of the impulse needed to reach an intended trajectory. So that typically involves how much propellant you would need, or you know, there's different types of engines. Some are more efficient than other. But basically, it's how much energy is required to be at a certain location at a certain time to reach a certain point in space. And so if you were to take a look at at cislunar space as a commercial map, you would want those delta Vs that you're going back and forth to to be as low as possible. And this is actually why you mentioned it at the beginning, why was 2032 chosen as the beginning for delta V? And that partly had to do with the asteroid Ryugu, uh, near Earth asteroids. The trajectory that's in that book is an actual trajectory. It's, I believe, December 13th, uh, I think it's 2033 is the trajectory. And of course, the, the asteroid miners needed a year or so to train. That trajectory and the delta V required to reach Ryugu on that date is less than the energy it would take to reach the surface of our own moon. And if you, and it would only be 28 days to cross that, that gulf, that area of space. And once you're there, you're at an asteroid that has one sixty thousandth of the gravity. And it is essentially a, a rubble pile. 
So you just tease boulders away from the surface and it has a, a rich store of resources. That's recently been confirmed by the Hayabusa team from JAXA. They found nitrogen and cobalt and titanium and iron and nickel in the actual sample that was returned from the Hayabusa 2 probe. I was very happy about that because, of course, I wrote this book before the Hayabusa 2 team got their probe to Ryugu, and I was thankfully in touch with them through a liaison with NASA who put me in touch with them so I could communicate with them as they literally brought that asteroid into focus. I was really amazed that I didn't have to change too much in the story. Uh, so I had written all that part and I was right about it being a rubble pile. The one thing I did have to add was that equatorial ridge that the asteroid actually had. And so I made that a part of the story as well. But other than that, it, the, the spectral analysis, all of that stuff was really real. And so you have a very low delta V on that date, December 13th, 2033, to go to the asteroid Ryugu. And that's why I started the story then. Yeah, and just to add a little bit of nuance on delta V, you know, the short route to do it in 28 days has a higher delta V than some slower looping routes might have yes. that could take, you know, you go into the into it in both books on. You know, you, so. Yeah. Yeah, they do that for the robo tugs, the robotic unmanned tugs that they send back from Ryugu every year or so. They will go for two, two and a half years to get back into a, a distant lunar retrograde orbit. But they can take their time because there's nobody on board. Gotcha. Then again, this is this multidimensional analysis of how this might evolve, right? Yeah, I, exactly. I, I love the fact that you thought this stuff through, right? Oh, it was. Uh, I, but but again, I, I I think it was Cyrus Foster from NASA Ames. He developed this tool called the Trajectory Browser that had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of trajectories for various objects, near-Earth objects and other objects. And I poured through that for a long time until I settled upon Ryugu. So Ryugu was not chosen by chance. It was the best mix of resources, the most easily accessible, and that's real. Yep. To give people a sense of uh, its size, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and it said it has about a half mile diameter. Yeah, it's about a, it's about a kilometer. And, and this is ridiculous that I know this off the top of my head, but it's 450 million tons. All so right. it's a chunk. It's a chunk. And it also, it's orbit, it goes around the sun, but its orbit overlaps that of Earth for a portion, not a huge portion, but not a trivial portion either. So it's one that we could run into one day. And right. at, half a, at half a mile, it's not quite a dinosaur killer, but it would knock the hell out of our advanced civilization for yep. sure. And that's, that part was part of Nathan's calculations in terms of being sued for exploiting it, thinking, well, if, it, it, if it's going to possibly hit the Earth and do damn near irreparable damage to our civilization. Maybe somebody won't sue me for mining it. Interesting. Interesting. Now that gets us into the area of law. Another interesting bit that you put in both books is the nexus of Lux Luxembourg City. Yeah. I did do just a tad of research enough to see that Luxembourg has actually implemented a fair bit of space law. Is that something that's actually happening yet in Luxembourg City? Yeah, I believe the the original law was 2017, and I think they simply called it the space law. So again, I based that in, in reality that Luxembourg wanted to make itself the most advanced space industry-friendly company on Earth. The idea being that if you did harvest and process resources in space, how do you benefit from that here on Earth? In other words, how do you re uh, return the benefits of that to an Earth economy? And so they wanted to be able to set up space companies that could exploit resources in space. And of course, they've joined the Artemis Accords. The United States followed pretty quickly after that with their own space law, again, to encourage commercial development of space. And of course, there's a, a number of caveats around that to try to make it reasonable, to try to work through this so that it's not a, a gold rush where people are just going crazy and grabbing things and claiming things. There's still the the concept that you cannot own celestial bodies or completely control them. They also don't want to stop or prevent people from or companies from developing these resources. So it's non-interference, both when you're doing it, but also non-interference with others who want to do it as well. It was just quite different than the age of discovery where people put their flags down and tried to own the, the territory and exclude others and do very mercantilist economics uh, and That's those right. kinds of things. And thankfully, there's no indigenous people to worry about this time around. So that takes at least that, that particular factor out. 
Yeah, not that we seem to have worried about them too much, unfortunately. Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, interesting. Which that brings us to another character. I don't know how you'd pronounce his last name. Lucas Rochat. How would you, how Lucas would you pronounce Lucas Rochat. Yeah, Rochat. He, is, he is the law lawyer character, the space lawyer character. And I would say he is sort of the Saul Goodman of space. He is a guy who starts out uh, quite desperate to get his legal practice working in space. And he very quickly finds Nathan Joyce, and Nathan Joyce finds him useful. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. with a nice little interlude in between where he gets thrown out of a helicopter. Right? It's a bit of a disagreement, yes, but yeah, these <laughs> things it. happen. All right, let's move on. Another, I thought, very nicely envisioned thing, but maybe in, a, in short, you can talk about your vision for the mining tech that the folks apply once they actually get to Ryugu. Yeah, the optical mining technology they used is based upon a real company. And oh my gosh, I think it's TransAstra. Hang on, I got to I got to make sure to get this right. Yeah, TransAstra is the company. And what the funny thing is because I live here in in Pasadena near Los Angeles, so many space companies are starting here because of course the Jet Propulsion Lab is close by, Caltech is close by. So when I started doing a great deal, and I mean a great deal of research on asteroid mining technologies, Imagine my surprise when the, one of the companies that had, I think, the most promising approach was just, you know, six or seven miles <laughs> from where I live. Uh, it's very convenient. And it allowed me to sit down and speak with them and Joel Sercell, the founder, quite a bit and really understand what it is they were doing. It, it, what's fascinating, they've already received several NASA contracts. They've, they've proved their spalling technology. Essentially, what they do and I really dig into this in the Delta V book, you can't use a great deal of physical violence like you would in, in normal terrestrial mining when it comes to mining on an asteroid. Because remember, think of it like a gravel pile that is in free fall in an absolute vacuum. And so if you start wielding a pick or in any way impacting it or using explosives, you're going to scatter that stuff all over the place. And so you have to figure out a way to mine it you have to completely reinvent mining. So it's nothing at all like terrestrial mining. And so TransAstra had conceived of this idea of taking it, completely bagging the asteroid material and using focused sunlight to spall the surface. That is, you can focus that intense sunlight and cause very high temperatures. And what it will do is it will both boil off the volatiles and shatter the surface and powder it. And then from there, you can start the process, the regolith. And, and I go into considerable detail on that. I do not do any hand waving. I don't pull the focus. As a matter of fact, many people have said that you, you could basically follow it as, as a roadmap or a blueprint on how to process asteroid regolith. Yeah, and I learned something new, something you know that I'd never even heard of, which was this carbonyl metallurgy. That's and right. I looked it up, and it turned out that was real. Now, isn't that mind blowing? See, you're a knowledgeable person, and so many sci-fi readers too read you know hundreds and hundreds of hard sci-fi books. The idea that this was news to many of them: gaseous carbonyl extraction, metal carbonyls, all of this stuff. It blew me away. Because again, I did a great deep dive on this. I talked to many different scientists, chemists. This is a tremendously cool technology, and I want as many people as possible to understand it. Yeah, why don't you give a very quick description of it? Sure. It is a way that you can turn metal into a gas is the best way to describe it. So it's a process by which you would take the raw regolith of the asteroid, and you would put it under a great deal of pressure in a certain carbon monoxide mixture. It's a very, very specific atmospheric situation or condition to cause aspects of the metal to start to turn into a gas and accumulate and become a metal carbonyl, which is a form of the metal that is, it transitions from a liquid and a gas and some various types of it, like I believe cobalt, for example, turns more into a powder than a liquid, but it allows you to store the metal in a liquid form that you can then pump around your space station or your processing facility without it having to be molten. And that was the other thing is you do not want in a microgravity environment to be creating molten metal. It's exceptionally dangerous. It requires a great deal of energy. And so this was a means to process the metal and put it in a convenient form that you can then later use. You can bring it back into metallic form by doing what's called uh, deposition. And this 
type of deposition is used very often in wafer, silicon wafer manufacturing here on earth. You have basically a vacuum. And again, you create certain conditions that cause the metal to depose out of the air from a gas onto a surface. And from that, you can form metallic components that are so pure that the iron will have difficulty rusting. It's really incredible. It creates this really terrific crystalline lattice of, of iron or nickel or cobalt, uh, titanium, many different types. So I go into that process, but again, this is all by my goal being to ex explain these things in a way that shows these tremendous benefits and these characters doing it within this story so that you absorb it at the same time that you're really interested in and, and invested in what they're doing. Indeed. And I will say that actually helped me be, make this feel more believable that we could actually Good. build stuff in space. Yeah. You know, it was one of those, it actually lowered the barrier of the willing suspension of disbelief to get the story That makes going. me feel good because again, you Googled that afterwards or duck, duck, goaded, whatever you, whatever you, you choose to use. But the point is it inspired you to go search. And then by searching it, you're like, huh, this is not bullshit. This yeah, is a real thing. And so you start to stack up those various technologies and it starts to really present a compelling case of an opportunity. Like we've had, for example, the MOND process, which is partly what that is based upon, has been around since the 1890s. And, and that, that kind of blows my mind that we've had technology like that. We've had technologies for mass drivers and ideas for designs for solar power satellites for decades and decades and decades. Yep, indeed, indeed. Well, let's kind of wrap up Delta V without giving away too much of the plot, but other than to say various things happened that put the crew, <laughs> the crew at risk, at great risk. That's they pretty deal, sad. sometimes yep. successfully, sometimes less so. Shit happens. The aftermath of Joyce's bankruptcy produces some nasty characters that do bad things to the ship by remote control, yada, yada, yada. But yep. nonetheless, three of them are able to build their own ship using that metal technology and head on back to Earth, but two get left behind. And or to choose choose to do so, yes. Yeah, choose to choose to choose to do so. Correct, correct. Yeah. And and again some hair raising adventures on the way back to Earth, but they make it. And that's essentially the end of Delta V. And then the next book, Critical Mass, starts on best I could calculate, March 20, 2038. Yes, indeed. So that's years later, not, not since they got back. So this is shortly after they return. And of course, they, they have a, a self-appointed mandate that they have got to be prepared to encounter the asteroid Ryugu again next time it has a close approach to Earth so that they can rescue their colleagues. And that gives them about four years time to do a much more difficult task. Now, when you mentioned with Delta V, the idea of them building their own ship, let's bear in mind that when, once you're out in space, you know, building a ship is, it's not like building an aerodynamic craft necessarily that, that has to ascend out of our atmosphere. Now, they did build a, a partly a lifting body for doing some aero braking. But in general, the, the booster phase, it doesn't have to deal with the atmosphere at all. And so it doesn't have to worry about aerodynamics or anything like that. The concern for them is that the distances they have to cover and the speeds they're using to try to encounter Earth at that point just a few micro radians of, of mistake in terms of the direction of their trajectory could leave them to miss Earth entirely. And that's part of the reason why two of the people had to remain behind, is to help them correct their course using more advanced computers that they had on the main ship. Yep. And there was issues about they were late getting off with respect to the window. It was a, definitely a good thrill. I don't want to give away all the, the all right, thrills. Cool. So starting in critical mass, we start seeing a little bit more of this mysterious woman behind the curtain, Erica Lisowski. Tell us about her. Yeah, Erica is to me a character. I, I imagine her as sort of a, a composite of the many people I've met at NASA, people who are well-meaning and, and want space to happen. They have dreams about the future, and yet they're constrained by the system they're in, by the bureaucracy they're in. And, and so I wanted to imagine a character, again, who was inspired by her grandfather who worked on the Apollo program, remembered those, those great days, and wanted to make that future finally happen. And 
I'll just say she thought out of the box and she realized that in her role, and of course I based her role on a real character, a real person in NASA, but this person of course in real life doesn't, doesn't behave like this, but a NASA uh, administrator or a manager who goes to these various events that these billionaires go to and it, so has access to speak with them. And of course, they're very interested in NASA contracts and sort of whispers ideas into their minds. You know, when I say whispers, sort of like plants into their mind opportunities that they might not have thought about. That's partly why the Erica Lazowski character introduces the economist Corapati to Nathan Joyce. It's to try to catalyze something, and it's partly why the company is called Catalyst, to try to get things moving in a way that she could not possibly get moving within NASA, to sort of inspire these individuals to take these ridiculous risks. And that's the role that she takes. And also to be there at certain key moments to try to help out when things go disastrously wrong, as they inevitably do. Great. So let's give our audience an update. What's happened in Earth, Moon, space in the couple of years that have ensued so far? Well, sure. Oh, you mean in the story or now in present day? No, in, in oh no, in the in the story. Okay. So I guess if you you were to think about it, the first book is really this disconnected story where these risk takers go out into deep space for four years, and you see their very difficult journey all of the things that they face. And of course, while they're gone, things are happening on Earth. And some of those things reach out and affect them. But the characters coming back, Critical Mass is, the title derives partly, in fact, from the critical mass of public opinion that we need, the critical mass of material that we need in space to start to make this happen. I would say the second book is really where the impact of that first journey starts to make its presence felt. It's where they are first, the, the public is first made aware of what is actually going on out there. And so at the time that critical mass begins, climate change and its effects are starting to kick in. We're starting to see economic disruptions. We're starting to see uncontrolled migration becoming an increasing issue. Species extinction, a number of different things are starting to build to a head. And that's partly why I brought fractional reserve banking into this, because again, I don't think many people understand, and it's, this always amazes me, understand why growth is really a, a requirement of our current banking system, why it is not okay for things to just stay constant or to shrink. Uh, deflation is a kind of a major disaster in such a system. And I, I, it depends on how much you want me to go into it, but suffice it to say, you the way money is created in such a system, it is, it, it is originated from commercial loans and other loans, and they have to be paid back with interest. And so the money supply has to continually grow, especially when you're talking about a mortgage. The principal that will eventually be paid back with interest is much bigger than the original loan. So you're constantly having to grow the money supply. And it's that requirement running into the face of climate change that is restricting the growth of economies. Then you've got all these developing nations, let's say India and China, who want to deliver better living conditions for their citizens. They can't be constrained because, uh, well, you know, we've already used up this or used up that. So they're going to try to push their development. It's all of these competing priorities that are building to a head on earth when my protagonists first get back to earth and are trying to mount this mission. So the resources that they have brought back to the edge of Earth's gravity well, and we're talking about 6,000 tons or more, they are of prime interest in the growing space race competition between China and the United States at the beginning of that book, because both of those countries are aware of the presence of those resources. And although they may not have approved of or even admitted they knew about that mission, they are very interested in those resources because they are strategically important. Yeah, and a very, and a very critical point that they, again, this discussion of Delta V and gravity wells, the fact that they're in orbit around the moon actually yep. is very, very important and makes their value much higher than if they were anywhere else. Yeah. I like to, to point people to these maps that you sometimes see, and Carl Sagan used to demonstrate this too. You have sort of a stretched or taut sheet into which you, you'd put a bowling ball and that would show the representation of what gravity looks like. It's like a deep depression in time space. And that is, let's say, Earth. It is a well. It's a gravity well. And of course, the moon has a 
smaller gravity well, but they've managed to put these resources at the very edge of that gravity well of the Earth Moon system. And from there, you can easily, well, much more easily reach the rest of the entire solar system. You can reach other near Earth asteroids, you can reach Venus, you can reach Mars, much less delta V required to do that from there versus launching out of Earth's deep gravity well. And so that's why it is a strategic location. Certainly no one has anywhere near the tonnage of resources that the characters do in the beginning of this book at the edge of Earth's gravity well. And and especially in such a refined form, we talked about the metal carbonyls. This is a form where you could turn it back into precisely shaped metal parts, components. And also they have quite a bit of propellant because they have 3,700 tons of water. That level of propellant and, and metal material is strategically absolutely critical to these other nations in their competition. Not at, not geopolitical competition, but astropolitical competition, which I think is coming quite soon. Yeah, and if Delta V, the you know, the story was significantly about Joyce and his co-conspirators kind of avoiding the grasp of government in critical mass, suddenly the superpowers are all over it. Yeah. And that, of course, you know, there's a minor spoiler there, but that might not have been widely apparent. I believe in, in the first book, Joyce he, Joyce, he explains it, that he is not a permit kind of guy. And, and of course, the powers that be, some of them knew what they were up to, but didn't prevent them from doing it. And I think there's many, many examples in history where governments did the same thing. And by the way, I'd like to point out that this is a really common mistake that I think people make, or at least let's say a, a misjudgment that asteroid mining is all about bringing things back to Earth, and nothing could be further from the truth. The major value of these resources is keeping them at the edge of Earth's gravity well so that you don't have to lift all of those materials back out of Earth's deep gravity well. You know, we have plenty of iron here. We have lots of titanium and nickel and all that other stuff by comparison. It's getting it up into space that is the enormous expense. And so you take 6,000 tons of such material and you put it at the edge of Earth's gravity well, and that is worth many billions of dollars because that's what it would take for you to bring a comparable amount of material up from Earth's gravity well. Yeah, I'm glad you made that distinction because I occasionally read these things about, oh, yeah, there's a, a asteroid of solid nickel. Just think how much that would be worth here on Earth. Like right. a- or the platinum thing. People always bring up Psyche, the Psyche asteroid, which yeah, is yeah. essentially a planetary core. And if you could only bring all that platinum back on Earth, it's like, well, okay, first of all, we talked about Delta V. How much Delta V, how much propellant would you have to expel to take hundreds of thousands of tons of platinum and bring it here, only to accomplish crashing the platinum market and making it as cheap as tin? But you know. Yeah, yeah, I love the fact, actually, that you that you understood and drew very vividly this kind of abstract concept of value based on position in gravity wells, and that really the road forward is doing a set of things such that we start a number of processes which build up usable material in space, not yep. here on Earth, and that that is the, the road up for humans to move into space. Yes, and that's why I start with the epigraph of Archimedes. Give me a place upon which to stand, and I can move the world. That idea that by building a Clark Station type place you know, beyond the moon, where it has spin gravity, it has pressure, it has life support, all of those things, it can become an economic engine uh, to start to move things forward because suddenly people, innovators, entrepreneurs in space do not have to provide everything. They don't have to create their entire atmosphere in which they're going to work. Instead, there is a location they can go to to execute on a, a, a business plan for space. Yep. And talking about business plans for space, one of the things that's happened in the intervening years is that there are now some mining operations on the moon. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the plan. I'm not aware of uh, mining operations. Oh, you mean in, in the book, of course. In the book. In the yes, book. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, oh. Yeah. yeah. yeah forget, the real, forget the real world. We're talking oh, yeah, fiction real here. World. Okay. So yes, in the book, there are mining operations going on. I have a brief explanation of what's going on. This is uh, 2038, after all, when critical mass begins. The Both the Chinese uh, and the Americans and the Europeans have, have bases, proto-bases near Shackleton Crater, near the peaks of eternal light. 
and they are trying to avail themselves of the the uh, the water that is believed, as you and I sit here right now, to be there. Uh, I think the best guess from the scientists that I talk to is that there may be significant overburden, what's called overburden with regard to that ice. That is, it would be uh, sublimated within regolith and there would need to be some processing. And of course, they'd have to start experimenting with how to do that. And they need to do that by going down into this very dark area that Shackleton Crater is really incredible. I would advise your listeners if they can to, to explore some of the tools that NASA has online. When you check out the 3D representation of Shackleton Crater, it's really incredible. It's about 21 kilometers across and it's quite deep and it is dark, 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 and which means it's going to be damn near absolute zero. So this is an extreme operating environment to start mining things in. Now, for good or ill, uh, Ryugu, at least it does spin somewhat, so it is not constantly at absolute zero. So there's some challenges there with Shackleton. One of the key challenges, of course, is that astropolitical race we were talking about, that competition between China and the United States, or let's put it more broadly, between authoritarianism and free enterprise and representative democracy, all that stuff. And that is a fraught environment where there's military risk, political risk, and my protagonists seek to avoid that area entirely for that reason. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I don't know if, uh, I, I suppose that Shackleton is so interesting for the fact that it may have water and CO2 down at the bottom of it. It was also the nexus of the, I think the second year of the TV series for all mankind yes. were similar, though this was much more focused on the battle for the crater, essentially. But it's interesting that two thoughtful teams came up with the same nexus for early exploitation. Well, you know, I think that's th- that's a reality. In other words, there is going to be an attempt to explore and exploit whatever resources are found in Shackleton and other nearby craters. And then there's also some aspects of the, the lunar North Pole which are interesting, but I think the focus right now is for the Lunar South Pole. I know that there's a probe going there soon. I cannot, for the life of me, remember it off the top of my head, but I believe it's a private rover that's going to land there. I think it's Japanese. But, you know, the idea that I wanted to get across also for critical mass by them going to the lunar equator was that to some degree, spectrographic analysis shows that there's a, an amount of, a small amount of water in just about all lunar regolith. Now, they're trace amounts, but it's not the only place. And of course, near-Earth asteroids, they also provide a, a great source of water propellant, potentially as well. So the advantage that my characters had was because of the Delta V book and the Ryugu expedition, they were bringing 3,700 tons. And that's just initially, much more comes later, so that they had ample propellant. And so they didn't have to avail themselves of Shackleton Crater and all of that geopolitical competition. And, and again, I think one of the key things that I, I am trying to get across in critical mass is the benefit to Earth. I wanted to connect what they were doing to Earth so that what's happening in the second book, Critical Mass, is they're not just trying to rescue their, their friends, their colleagues. What's, what's occurred is that they're starting to appreciate the disruption, the, the suffering that's going on in dealing with rapidly changing climate and also economic conditions that are getting quite dire on earth. And there's also the geopolitical competition. So down on earth, the risk of Kessler syndrome from war and all of these things could be addressed by really growing the economy, by, by creating off world energy, solar power satellites and, and originating resources in space to get economic activity and growth going out there, which can benefit the earth. Again, not without, not with bringing all those materials back to Earth, but by creating the jobs and the activity in space to benefit Earth, to bring energy to bear, to say, pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, to try to correct the problems with Earth's atmosphere, among many other opportunities. And so the characters and their confederates managed to construct a pretty cool space station orbiting in the moon. Yes. And the thing about that space station is, again, I have explored various ways to illustrate it. And really what you come down to is it looks a lot like a lot of these space stations resemble what you saw in 2001, because this is, of course, you go back to Werner von Braun's Taurus. You have a spin gravity space station that 
unlike the spin gravity ship in Delta V, this is a continuous ring. It is a continuous metal ring, an enclosed pressurized envelope in which they can work that is much more robust, has much more reliable energy, and can serve as a a launch pad, if you will, for all of the operations that they want to do on the moon's surface. And in being located in a Lissajou orbit out at L2, it is close enough that they can do teleoperations on the surface of the moon. And they can have robots down there working that can work 24-7 and try to execute on a business plan that they're doing there, again, to avail themselves of much more resources, which they can then process on a refinery at the station to then start to build out this economy. Because again, it's going to require millions and millions of tons of uh, refined material to really get things going. And I, I explored that a bit early in, in the book, what it takes to really get this, this renaissance in space started. Yep. And one of the technologies that you bring to bear, again, is space-based solar energy. You know, I used to be a skeptic about that, but I recently got connected through a VC to a company that's actually working on it. And I now have penciled it out saying, you know, there's still some things that need to be improved, but it's within our grasp, probably. It is. It is. And, and I think that will only become more so. Again, imagine if you had hundreds of thousands of tons of refined material and you had robotic units and a modular robotic system that allowed you to build these systems concurrently. And, and so you didn't have to have a whole bunch of humans in spacesuits welding things, as one typically sees from the 90, 1960s illustrations. But instead, you had these hexagonal components that could build these things from small, easily manufactured com components, again, with deposing metal from car metal carbonyls. You could rapidly start to build these. Now, a 7,400-ton solar power satellite, John Mankin, uh, he has a design, it's called an SBS Alpha. This is a two gigawatt satellite. It could create two gigawatts of electricity. And once more, in this book, I do not hand wave at all. I, I think having read the book, all of the math and all of the economics, I just lay out there in a debate around a, a dinner table between two opposing groups who have differing views on whether solar power satellites make sense, whether they make sense to help out the earth, the atmosphere, and what they are capable of. And Honestly, having done a great deal of research on this, I think they are incredibly promising. Yeah, particularly if we can find ways to accumulate the material in space. You know, launching it, but launching it very tough. Very tough. Though these these this venture back company, if you project out the cost of you know the heaviest stuff from SpaceX, uh, maybe we're approaching it in, in five or ten years. But if you can accumulate the materials in space, as you point out, very yep. different economics. And a, and a mass driver as well. And again, here we're going all the way back to 1976 and Gerard K. O'Neill's High Frontier, which I reread once a year at this point, because it's really an incredible book. I would recommend it for people. This is a nonfiction book. This was going back to a time when NASA was seriously considering this, and the public conversation here in the U.S. at least was that this was a real possibility. Now, back then, a two gigawatt satellite was twenty thousand ton metric tons at least, and so of course they've really slimmed it down with improved technology. But they were seriously thinking about it. Now, in 1998, NASA did another economic study on this to say, okay, look, does this really make sense? And they had a payback time of about six months. Now, that's, but that's only if you manage to get the materials up there. And then, of course, there's all the, the transmission conversion issues, the loss of efficiency there. The number that people keep coming back to is that it's 9% efficient to send by a microwave energy from, from orbit to the surface of Earth where it will be received by what's called a rectenna. And yes, it's 9% efficient. But I would always point out to people that Right now, solar panels are about 23% efficient. And if you have a, a thermal plant, let's say a gas powered power plant, it's about half of the energy radiates away in terms of heat. And the last thing I would say about that is a solar panel in orbit, let's say in geosynchronous orbit, is about seven times more productive than one here on the surface. Because of course you have night, you have higher latitudes, you're gonna get less incident light, and so on. I think you can produce about a thousand watts per square meter at noon on a sunny day on the equator. 
And in geosynchronous orbit, it's 1,348 watts per square meter on a fairly constant basis. Yeah, and you don't have to deal with weather, et cetera. That's and, right. And, and even, as it turns out, when you really run the numbers, a massive solar farm, say, in a desert, there's a non-trivial expense keeping the dust off the, off the cells. Exactly. And I think I, I remember at one point having a discussion with an official about this, and I think where I really changed his mind was, let's not forget unfolding potential economic and political chaos here on Earth. If you're talking about using uh, areas of the world where you're going to put in big wind farms, uh, they might be wiped out by hurricanes or wildfires. Solar power arrays have valuable materials in them. If people start to cannibalize them and rip them apart and sell the parts, you know, if you have chaos going on on the surface, it's going to be much more difficult to maintain and keep building out these systems. So you could have these challenges. So one of the virtues is that by having these solar power arrays at a geosynchronous orbit, it's like 22,000 miles up, the antennas are cheap to build. They're easy to fix. And, and a lot of people don't realize that if you, they look like a netting, you know, you could put these above crops. You could put these even above solar panels. So you could have grazing land and you could have this like a circus net almost above animals grazing. And they're easy to replace in case they get damaged. And yet they could receive a great deal of energy and pump it right back through our existing uh, transmission lines to wherever they need to go. Yep. And an interesting point that this, this new wide area rectenna concept, the energy density is sufficiently low that's actually safe for humans to walk under it. Yeah, there, there was a presenter that I, I was trying to find a link to his video, but he used to do these presentations where he would give his presentation and the entire time he was giving it, he would have one of these microwave transmitters focused on him while he was up at the top. And at the end, he would, of course, reveal that he was, it's kind of like I'm soaking in it type commercial here. But, you know, the idea that it's going to roast birds and stuff like that, that it's a death ray from space. That is not the case when it comes to, I think it's like 100 watts per square meter. 230 watts per square meter used to be the OSHA standard, and I think they reduced it. But, you know, death ray is the usual claim that people say. Now, and I can think of anything more difficult to do because you're talking about a very large, you know, object in space that is completely visible. So everybody could watch what's happening on it. It's not like somebody could secretly turn it into a death ray. That's a good point. Now, uh, you talked earlier about how the space economy could help the earthbound economy. And now the coupling, one of the main couplings that is hypothesized in the book is through essentially monetary systems where pretty much what you'd call a DAO is created. One of the more interesting characters, Raymond Marin, yeah. is you know, a super techie and super crypto geek. Who comes from Venezuela, which has its own economic convulsions in real yeah, life. Yeah, he, uh, he learned the lesson. Commies, not so good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a damn good. Yeah, not a fan. Yeah, not a fan of communism. Very, very interesting character. One of my favorite characters in the books. Oh, good. And so, talk a little bit about the vision of the cis lunar commodity exchange and the related financial thingies going on there. Sure. And for that, I'll I'll go back a bit to Damon and two thousand six, two thousand eight. You know, I actually first finished that book in two thousand six. Uh, it was published by Dutton, republished by Dutton in 2008. And that book talked about cryptocurrency. And this is, of course, you know, before Bitcoin was really starting to take off. It, the idea of monetary systems being done cryptographically as opposed to a fiat currency by a government, that always intrigued me, that idea that money is a construct. It's a mental construct. It's what we believe in. And of course, you want to base it on something intrinsically valuable wherever possible. And this is why the gold standard was always interesting to me. But of course, gold has the issue that you can't just instantly originate a whole bunch of it in case the economy is growing. And so you can have these perverse situations where people want to hold on to their money because it's increasing in value all the time. And so that was part of the agrarian movement. I remember sort of the underpinnings of the Granger movement in the 1890s, where you would have farmers that would apply for a loan for their seed. And by the time they planted it and everything else, money was worth much more and they were, they were screwed no matter what they did. So cryptographic systems for money interest me. And they've become sort of a third rail in some quarters because there's been so much froth and so much, well, 
let's say malfeasance to some degree. There are some bad actors. There are some good actors. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but it is a wild and woolly territory. You and I talked, I think, before we started recording here a bit about the banking system in the 1800s in the United States and all these different currencies that were being experimented with at the time. This is before the Federal Reserve. And so that was also a wild, woolly period. And recall that that was at a time when America was really getting on its feet and starting to exploit the resources of the continent. So it's a very similar situation to what we've got now. And yet here, when it comes to space, we're trying to figure out how to marshal all of human activity in space and have it have us build out a legal and economic framework without turning it into a Cold War 2.0 or some shooting war in space, uh, basically a pissing match between whose currency we use. I think that can be a really, really dangerous element. And so that's what I was trying to explore in this. How do you set up a new economic system that incentivizes people to go into space, gives them a comfort level in terms of a, a legal framework? some sort of legal recourse and smart contracts figure in here. It's basically a trustless environment and trustless systems like those in cryptocurrency, I find could really be useful in addressing that. Yeah, though I must say, this is where, again, a little skepticism came in in my mind. Sure. One of your characters actually says, you are confusing money with wealth. And this happens all the time when I when I talk to people about money and finance. Mm -hmm. I call it the reification problem. You know, someone says, you know, Bitcoin is worth, you know, market cap of $500 billion or something. And I go, well, yeah, maybe if somebody will actually exchange it for yes. actual wealth. Because, And it's the other thing I also like to point out is that even if a monetary system disappeared, the wealth is still there. And there's actually several historical examples where that happened, most yep. famously in Germany, Austria, and Hungary in the early 20s, where a hyperinflation took the value of the mark, say, to one and a quadrillion, essentially zero. Yeah. The economy ground to a halt. The German government said, all right. All the old money's gone. We're starting a new money, put it back into circulation. And literally within a week, the economy restarted. And the reason is, people say, oh, that seems very strange. I say, well, the reason is because money is not wealth. It's only a pointer and a signaling modality. In reality, wealth is factories, it's trucks, it's farms, it's human skill. Yeah. People with money in a mattress got screwed. Yeah. People who invested in real estate. You know. Or bondholders got screwed. In yeah. Germany, people who owned stocks lost about half. People lost in real estate lost about 25%. People in government bonds lost 100%. People with money in the mattress lost 100%. And so I do think that there's a little bit of hand waving there in that. Well, you know what? The, one of the things that I'm, I really emphasize here is that the, the Luna, and of course, you know, I, I call the, the coin the Luna, even though in reality, the Luna coin was just a fiasco. But I look at it this way. There's no better name for a, a crypto coin on the moon than Luna. But anyway, that aside, it is it is based not upon cryptographic. It's not based upon uh, stake. It is based upon intrinsically valuable material. So in other words, they are originating and bringing into this economy new sources of energy and physical resources, titanium, iron, nickel, and what they're doing is they are growing the money supply based on that. So intrinsically valuable things that, like you said, were this Luna coin to fail, those materials would still be around and would be reassigned by some other system. But the point is, you don't want to have a system that is based upon just, let's say, a proof of work like a Bitcoin would. When you're growing the amount of resources and energy, that's obviously the thing that you're going to focus on is the store of value. Yep. And yeah, and that part I did like, though, when you sort of do some pencils, you say, well, how valuable are the things being created in space at this point in time? And the answer is they're way down in the 0.01 percentile range of the global GDP. So it's hard to see how they manage the same save the day in the short term, at least. Well, remember also that people in a shrinking system. So in, in what's envisioned in critical mass is that you're having essentially deflation. You're having tremendous disruption. There's Little confidence in the future, the near future, simply because there's so much disruption. Even if countries themselves are still able to produce crops and factories, they're dealing with a, a whole bunch of refugees or they're caught up in a conflict and wars are very costly. The idea of having something out of the fray, something that you can invest in, which is not just stable, but reliably growing and will continue to grow for quite some time, 
one could imagine that were you to be an early investor in a, a cislunar industry, let's say a refinery, that 20, 30 years later, your stake could be worth vastly more. So really, it's a vote in that future is really what it is. And I think that's a very good point, actually. And particularly if, if the back here on Earth, we're in a what seems like a downward spiral, even a relatively modest, but uh, in the short term, but eventually potentially gigantic wedge of growth could actually be very, very good for both morale and at least to some degree for finance. Well, think of this. Think of this. The Some of the estimates that were given when I was doing the research for this, and I think it was in High Frontier, that at a very torrid rate of growth, or I mean, really high level of growth, if you started to build out a, an economy off-world in our solar system, you could expand for 12,000 years at that same very high growth rate without before you even start touching resources within the planets. This is just from asteroid and other material and moons. It's just an incredible rate of growth. I mean, 12,000 years, we could solve a hell of a lot of problems, economics and medical and technology-wise during that time that would help us get to the next level in that 12,000 years. But just imagine that also a growth where you're not feeling guilty, you're not despoiling the Rockies, you're not befouling our atmosphere. In fact, you're helping it because you're bringing energy to bear that can be used to help preserve the earth, our home world, help benefit everyone on it, not just us, but people straight around the world. We could deliver economic growth to everyone. That would only help to preserve the peace. And again, Having people invest in the future, I think, is the best way to have a preserved peace is because people have things to look forward to. Yep, I like that a lot. And, and as you say, 10,000 years is a very long time, particularly when you consider humans have only actually had control or had, I'd say, a reasonable approach to reality for about 350 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think agriculture is 10,000 years. Like, yeah, we, ag- we, yeah, science and logic, well, not logic, science and sort of the ability to actually verify information is only 350 years old. That's right. The enlightenment. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. That's amazing how far we've come, but we're rushing so close to fast at the wall also that we have to pull back. It's a, you know, a very complicated maneuver that humanity has to do to not kill itself from exponential growth, not put itself into a nosedive. And and, you know, I like your vision about how space can be one of the vectors that help us get over this end of the 21st century barrier is yes. actually very invigorating. I think we need to factor it into Drake's equation, quite frankly, because I think it's, it's, some, it's an obvious step in the process. I wouldn't even call it a release valve, because the funny part about this is, if you really think about it, it's, hmm, are we going to avail ourselves of the vast entirety of the enormous universe around us, or are we going to stay here on this rock? <laughs> you know, and it seems kind of an obvious question of what we should be doing. Yeah. And I will say, personally, I believe the whole point of humanity is to bring the universe to life. Yeah. Well, there you go. And, and yeah, I but- completely disagree with people who view life as a cancer. And I've heard that described like we would spread and despoil the into That's ridiculous. I mean, spreading life to me is like you said. That's that's the impetus of all life is, is yeah. we expand life and it creates a rich tapestry. And, you know, I think that's a vast improvement. Yeah. And life is just so much more interesting than dead matter. I mean, it, yes. and as far as we know, this is one of the great – I talk about this on the podcast all the time, the Fermi paradox. For It was Enrico Fermi at Los Alamos hearing some young physicists chatting about the Drake equation said, well, if there's so many of them out there, where are they, right? right. And, the, and I've spent – years reading everything I can about the Drake equation, going out to the SETI Institute, talking to other knowledgeable people. And I think the honest answer is we just don't know. We might be it. It, it you know, when I was 14, of course. Imagine that. My God. That, yeah, and, and, and some people find that depressing. I find that amazingly empowering, but also scary. We don't want to fuck up if we're the only <laughs> one. You know, if there's a hundred thousand other civilizations in the Milky Way and we blow it and roast the planet, oh well, frankly, at the scale of the history of the universe. But if we're the only ones, we have an amazing duty not to blow it until we know one way it is a solemn duty, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's huge. It's huge. And until we know, I believe we must uh, practice the the uh, precautionary principle and not put I guess I would call it general intelligence at risk by doing stupid ass shit. Right? I would agree. And and by the way, this gets to the planetary chauvinism versus free space. And, and really, this is something that I try to dig into in these books. And that is the, the debate between 
the people who think we should settle Mars. And I've had this debate with quite a few people that we need to be a multi-planetary species. And the exception I take to that is that by going to a place like Mars, a different place, it is going to have different uh, conditions. 38% of gravity, for example, slightly less than 1% of the pressure of our Earth. And, and these are very different conditions. And this is why I really think building in free space, building our biosphere using, yes, millions of tons of refined material to create vast spinning like O'Neill cylinder size uh, habitats to build, learn how to build our own biosphere, our own soil from scratch, learn how to be stewards of these complex ecosystems so that we can better care for all life. I think that is one of our absolute primary responsibilities, but by learning how to do that, we guarantee what you just said, which is the, the continuance of life. By, by going to settle Mars or some other place, we're changing it such that we have all these little pockets that are vastly different. And I'm not sure in 5,000 years we would even recognize each other. And I think that's okay too, frankly. I think we should try sure. it all. But I do think there's uh, – you guys make a good – you make a good case in the book that, for instance – artificial gravity versus low gravity. Hmm, yeah. Right. Uh, very, yeah, very we don't know what the minimum dose of gravity is. Yep, we don't yep. know what we need. And that's an amazing thing in 2023 that we don't know that. Interesting. Well, there's so much more we could talk about here and we didn't do much justice to the plot and critical mass, but let me tell the listeners, it's really a thriller. A lot goes on and it's well worth reading. So if this at all picked your fancy, I strongly recommend reading Delta V, which I reread about two weeks ago. I oh, read cool. it when it first came out. And then I read Critical Mass when it came out, which was sometime this winter. I don't quite remember when. And I'd recommend both of them. And they're available on Kindle or at your favorite, probably not at your favorite bookstore, but it depends on the you store. can probably get them to order it, right? Well, I just want to thank you very much, Daniel Suarez, for writing so many good books and for being such a good guest here on The Jim Rudd Show. Oh, I appreciate it, Jim, and it's so fun to be on. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.